I rise to speak to the tabling of the interim report of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. As parliamentarians, we are elected by the Australian people to make and scrutinise the laws of this country. However, about half of the law of the Commonwealth, by volume, consists of delegated legislation rather than acts of parliament. I would like to repeat that. Half of the law of the Commonwealth, by volume, consists of delegated legislation rather than acts of parliament. And in 2019, 20 per cent of the 1,675 pieces of delegated legislation made by the executive were exempt from disallowance by the parliament and scrutiny by the committee. The volume of delegated legislation made by the executive and the frequent exemption of these laws from parliamentary oversight restricts our capacity as parliamentarians to perform our scrutiny and lawmaking functions. The committee's inquiry considers the source, nature and ongoing appropriateness of the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight informed by expert evidence and the committee's own scrutiny work over the past 88 years. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, this interim report <coughs> focuses on how systemic issues in legislation, procedure and practice have combined to exempt delegated legislation made in response to the pandemic from parliamentary oversight and what actions can and should be undertaken to resolve these issues. Now, part one of the report provides an overview of the legis legis legislative framework relied upon by the government to make delegated legislation in response to COVID. The Biosecurity Act 2015 is the key component of this framework. As the report explains, the Biosecurity Act confers extraordinarily broad powers on the executive to make non-disallowable delegated legislation which restricts personal rights and liberties and overrides any Australian law, including laws made by this parliament. Despite the significance of the delegated legislation making powers in the Biosecurity Act, they received little consideration when the Biosecurity Bill was being considered in 2014 and early 2015. Accordingly, the committee recommends that the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills or another independent body or person review the delegation of legis legis legislative powers in the Biosecurity Act. In future, the committee urges all parliamentarians to carefully consider the delegated legislation making powers in emergency legislation to ensure that the exercise of these powers is subject to an appropriate degree of parliamentary oversight. Part two of the report considers the specific systemic factors that have contributed to the exemption of delegated legislation made in response to COVID-19 from parliamentary oversight. These features include the cancellation of parliamentary sittings, the exemption of delegated legislation from disallowance, the classification of delegated legislation as non-legislative, the duration of delegated legislation and the exclusion of delegated legislation from scrutiny by parliamentary committees. In particular, I would like to highlight the committee's concerns about the exemption of emergency delegated legislation from disallowance. Disallowance is one of the most important tools that the parliament has at its disposal to maintain control of delegated legislation. Despite the importance of this procedure, nearly 20 per cent of all delegated legislation made in response to the pandemic between January and July this year was exempt from disallowance. And this includes all 27 legislative instruments made under the Biosecurity Act and six advanced to the finance minister determinations, which allocated an additional $2.1 billion of public funds to aspects of the government's response to COVID-19. Consequently, parliamentarians have been prevented from scrutinising and, if necessary, disallowing significant COVID-19 response measures. 
These include travel bans on Australian citizens, the declaration and extension of the human biosecurity emergency period, and restrictions on people entering and exiting certain areas within Australia. The committee fully appreciates the government's need to make such laws in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, worse, where such laws have the capacity to restrict personal rights and liberties or override laws made by parliament, the committee considers that parliamentarians must, I underline, must have the capacity to scrutinise and, if necessary, disallow these laws. The committee was also concerned to discover that one in five non-disallowable legislative instruments made in response to COVID-19 are exempt from disallowance due to pre-existing grounds determined by the executive rather than the parliament. Accordingly, the report recommends that any grounds for exempting emergency-related delegated legislation from disallowance should be set out in primary legislation. I also draw the Chamber's attention to systemic issues which have excluded COVID-19-related delegated legislation from scrutiny by parliamentary committees. The standing orders currently prevent the committee from considering non-disallowable legislative instruments in its regular scrutiny work. To inform this inquiry, the committee found that 48 per cent of non-disallowable legislative instruments made in response to COVID-19 between January and July this year appear to raise potential technical scrutiny issues. However, the procedural constraints imposed by the standing orders prevented the committee from attempting to resolve these issues with, with the relevant department or ministers. Accordingly, the committee recommends that all delegated legislation made during these times of emergency is subject to technical legislative scrutiny, regardless of its disallowance status. Given the significant content and volume of delegated legislation made in response to COVID-19, the committee also recommends that a Senate Select Committee be established in times of emergency to specifically consider the policy merits of delegated legislation made in response to that emergency. Can I conclude by saying that the committee is grateful to everyone who has made a submission to this inquiry and given evidence to the committee's first ever public hearings. We trust that this interim report and its focus on delegated legislation made in response to COVID-19 provides a useful case study of the detrimental impact of long-standing long systemic issues on parliament's capacity to appropriately oversee delegated legislation made in times of emergency. Our final report will further consider these systemic issues and the options available to the parliament to resolve them. In the meantime, the committee calls on all parliamentarians to carefully consider their responsibilities as representatives of the people to ensure that delegated legislation made in response to emergencies is subject to rigorous parliamentary oversight. That is a responsibility that we have as parliamentarians, mm -hmm. and this is the reason why we sit in this place. Mm -hmm. Can I also acknowledge the hard work of Committee Secretary Glenn Ryle and all his team? This is the first ever inquiry of this committee, and their commitment to producing excellent work is to be highly commended. I and other committee members very much appreciate all your efforts. With these comments, I commend the committee's interim report on the exemption of emergency delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight to the Senate, and I thank my colleagues on the committee for their hard work and their willingness to participate in this very important work on behalf of the people of Australia. Mm -hmm. Senator Sicconi. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I just wanted to take a few moments to associate myself with the remarks by uh, Senator Ferrienti wells um, When I first came into this place, I had, to be frank, no idea about this committee. And um, quite frankly, it's probably one of the, the committees that I enjoy my time um, with colleagues, and it's good to see other colleagues on this committee uh, in the chamber at the moment. Um, it's certainly been fascinating to see how our democracy works, and you know, being a part of the Senate, the House of Review, 
keeping the executive uh, accountable. Um, I know there's only the one member of the executive here in the place currently, but um, I think it's fair to say we do enjoy our time on the committee uh, scrutinising the delegated legislation, the instruments, following up with ministers and uh, ensuring that we are doing our jobs as parliamentarians uh, as part of our democracy. Um, the Senate uh, Select Committee for the um, scrutiny of delegated legislation and it has had other names along the way, but it's certainly one of the oldest committees in this place. Uh, its purpose is to really ensure that we uh, are scrutinising delegated legislation enacted by members of the executive and is subject to appropriate scrutiny by the legislator. It's a role of us in this place to write the laws of the land, yet I think many Australians would be surprised to learn just how much law is written. And as we'd heard from the, the chair of the committee, close to 50 per cent. 50 per cent written, enacted, stamp of approval by the executive, not through the parliament. Whilst there is no doubting that there is a role for such delegated legislation to exist, it is nonetheless appropriate that in an instant where law is made by members of the executive, it is subject to appropriate oversight by this parliament and by this Senate, and most importantly to disallow any instances where it is resolved by the Senate that such a measure is necessary. As the report articulates, the volume of delegated legislation as a proportion of total Commonwealth law is substantial. Even more substantial is the proportion of this delegated legislation that is exempted from scrutiny. All Australians should be concerned at the readiness with which government is prepared to exempt delegated legislation from consideration by the parliament. As mentioned earlier, whilst there is merit in the existence of delegated legislation, one is right to question whether exemption provisions for this legislation is entirely in accordance with the principles of the separation of powers that make up all good systems of governance. The interim report that's been tabled has a particular focus on the emergency delegated legislation that has come about as a result of the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Almost a quarter of these measures, some of which had a significant impact on the community, were exempted from disallowance. Questions as to whether the individual freedoms of our citizenry ought to be curtailed are some of the most significant that any decision maker in this building may be forced to consider. Owing to this, they necessarily ought to be subject to the highest standards of democratic exemption and examination, sorry, as one would expect in a nation such as ours. Regrettably, the, the report also finds that there are instances where government falls short of this standard and systemic reasons for how this has come about. And as the Senate, as a democratically elected body, representatives of the community, we must resist this. After all, we are the House of Review. Whilst I fully appreciate why government, any government for that matter, would like to dispense with such inconvenience wherever possible, we owe it to those who have gone before us and with such toll have established our norms of parliamentary primacy in lawmaking, to clearly demonstrate the bounds of the tolerance of this House. I, like the Chair, would like to place on, my, oh, place on the record uh, my thanks, and obviously of that um, Senator Carr, who's obviously not here today, to say thank you to the Secretariat for their work. And I, to be fair to say, I don't think without the support of the Secretariat, we wouldn't have been able to produce such a comprehensive report and bet that we were able to present today. I want to say thank you to uh, my other colleagues on the committee, in particular the chair and the deputy chair, for their advice, their uh, wisdom. Um, and you know, maybe one day I myself may be chairing such a committee. And uh, thank you, Senator Scar. I, I would look forward to you being my deputy at some stage as well. But certainly the wealth of knowledge that those two senators bring to the table is something that we really do need to acknowledge.
And again, um, the highly cooperative and bipartisan nature, um, it should be noted, in which we've all been able to conduct um, our work. Senators can trust that the interests of this House are in good hands with the leadership of this committee. And uh, once again, I commend uh, the report to the Senate. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on, uh, on this report and indeed uh, do so as an outsider, not a member of this very important committee of the parliament. Um, I must, uh, I, I, as I stand here, I just want to say, and I mean this genuinely, I think uh, the words that we've heard from Senator Ferravanti Wells today in, uh, in uh, addressing this report are some of the most important words spoken in this chamber uh, since the time that I've been here. I, I just want to reflect on something I heard today in the chamber, and I'll come back to uh, the point that uh, uh, the chair was, um, that Senator Ferraventi was, was making. Uh, Senator Patterson stand up, stood up during the committee stage of the, uh, of the uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, bill, and he, he made the statement that the government is responsible to the people. And that is not actually the case under our constitution. The way it works is the government of the day is uh, responsible through ministers to this parliament, and it is this parliament that is responsible to the people. And that's really important. Uh, I just want to draw back to, uh, to, the, um, to the constitution, and that's, that's the, 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 sort of, uh, the, the, the gravitas or, or the importance of, of the, the statements being made in the chamber. Uh, part one, section one of our constitution entitled legislative power states, the legislative power of the Commonwealth shall be vested in the federal parliament, which shall consist of a queen, a senate and a house of representatives, and which is here and after called the parliament or the parliament of the Commonwealth. It is, it is the parliament's role to pass laws. And that's a really important principle because the people who write uh, the delegated legislation, um, of which half in volume is written by officials, are not responsible to the people. They are not able to be removed by a vote of the people. In fact, it's very difficult for even a minister to remove a person uh, who might be writing this delegated legislation. When legislation is to be uh, considered, it ought to be done uh, in an open manner, in a Senate chamber where it can be debated and where the people can watch and see what people say and they can, uh, at least once every three years, or perhaps six in the case of, uh, uh, of some senators, of, of senators they can uh, exercise their right to either support that member or to have them removed. Hold them accountable, thank you. And that is not the case for delegated legislation. And uh, it concerns me, and I think we should pay regard uh, to the, the two very senior people that are the chair and the deputy chair of the committee, with a great deal of experience in this place, and uh, I, I commend Senator Ferravanti Wells because um, actually it's a committee I really didn't notice very much until you started to chair uh, the committee. Uh, I might say, um, and and having having someone as, as strong as Senator Ferravanti Wells, and indeed uh, backed up by Senator Carr, is a very powerful combination. And. Uh, uh, I, uh, I used to watch Wacker Williams come in here and he'd, he'd uh, uh, stand up and he'd move these motions uh, announcing a, a possible disallowance. I used to think, geez, he's a rebel, not, not understanding that the... Not, I know, of course, I like rebels. I love rebels. And uh, uh, you know, perhaps falsely, that was how I developed an affinity with Wacker. And uh, uh, he... Um, uh, but but uh, since... This committee has been chaired uh, by the current leadership, uh, chair and deputy chair. 
I've certainly started to take notice, and I must congratulate Senator Ferravanti Wills for the do job that she is doing. Uh, but uh, again, I say her contribution this afternoon is one of the most important contributions I have heard in this chamber uh, for, for my time being here. And I, I would ask that all senators listen to what has been said, look at the series of reports that are coming from this committee, because it talks uh, and it 's directed at us and our responsibility and our responsibility to our constitution and to the people uh, to whom we represent Senator Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I too would like to make some remarks on this uh, interim report on the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight and first, if I could just acknowledge the kind remarks from Senator Patrick. Uh, I couldn't agree more. If I could seek to associate myself with the remarks of Senator Ciccone, and given he associated himself with the remarks of Senator Ferravani Wells, that means I'm associating myself with your remarks. So we're all associates. I love him. And Senator Patrick, you are absolutely correct that we serving on this committee are very fortunate to have uh, Senator Ferravani Wells as our chair and Senator Carr. That's Carr, not Scar, as our deputy chair. And as a new, a relatively new senator to this place, as uh, in the class of 2019, with my good friend Senator Ciccone and Senator Davey, and Senator Green is not here today, but I'm sure she would concur. Uh, there are three things I took, I've taken from the leadership demonstrated from Senator Ferravani Wells and Senator Carr on this committee. And the first is the importance of that experience and wisdom that they bring to the process. It is irreplaceable and just so important. Secondly, the collegiality with which they have conducted themselves. And, and one of the lessons I've learned from serving on this committee is you have to divorce the partisan from the nonpartisan. And I think both Senator Ferravani Wells and Senator Carr do that extremely well. And thirdly, and most importantly, the deep and abiding respect they each have for the institution of parliament, the deep and abiding respect they have for the institution of parliament. And that, that is reflected, that respect for the institution of parliament is reflected in this report. And it's reflected in the first recommendation of this report that parliamentarians, not politicians, parliamentarians, that we are we're not just politicians, we're parliamentarians, should give consideration to the appropriateness of exempting delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight me mechanisms. We should do that as parliamentarians. And reflecting on that point that we're parliamentarians, also politicians, but parliamentarians first and foremost, I commend uh, the members, the senators, my colleagues, to have a look at sections 4.31 and 4.33 of the report, which contain some submissions that were made uh, to the inquiry. And I'll quote them. I'll quote them for you. First one in 4.31, and I quote, the rulemaking process should or needs to be separated from the political process, end quote. End quote. The second quote, 4.33, the determination should be exempt from disallowance to prevent political considerations interfering with what should be a technical and scientific process." End quote. Now, those were two submissions made by government departments, and I think they reflect more than anything an institutional view with respect to these matters, an institutional view which we as senators need to be aware of, and in a context through this report where we are robustly reasserting, robustly reasserting the importance of the parliamentary processes. Because what are these political processes? What are these political considerations? Are they not parliamentarians, parliamentarians, not just politicians, parliamentarians as democratically elected representatives exercising their judgment on behalf of their constituents and their country? That's what these political considerations are. Are they not parliamentarians making an assessment on how the proposed laws of the land will impact upon the people they represent and their country? 
Those are the political considerations. Are they not parliamentarians acting as a check and balance upon the executive? We in this place acting as a house of review, as Senator Ciccone referred to it. Are they not parliamentarians being accountable, being accountable, accountable to and facing their constituents on a regular basis in free and fair elections as part of a liberal democracy? Those are the political considerations. Those are the political considerations. And they go to the heart, the absolute heart of our liberal democracy. And we must always, always remember that and cherish it, respecting the institution of parliament. Finally, I too would like to give some thanks to the members of the Secretariat who worked uh, on, the, uh, on the report. And, uh, Chair, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Senator Ferraveni Wells, you will always be chair to me. Um, I must say you forgot um, one person we should always remember is the prof, Professor Edgar. Yes. Where would we be without our good yes. Professor Edgar? Always there, ready to give his, uh, his wisdom and educated view on, uh, on sometimes the most arcane of legal matters. So thank you, Professor Edgar. Thank you, Glenn and Laura and the whole team. And his knowledge of contract law as well. You're absolutely right, Chair. Um, we're, we're at, you're, you're an absolute terrific crew, and uh, we've been extremely fortunate to have the benefit of, uh, of your assistance. I, too, commend this report to the Senate. Thank you. The question is that uh, the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, declare it carried.